Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Cassandra Hansen, and I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Jen DeRosa, and we are the hosts of Sustainable Solutions. This session is recorded, and the recording will be available on our JHU AAP ESP YouTube channel. After the presentation today, we will have time for questions and answers for our presenter. So please feel free to provide your questions and posts in the Q&A section. So what is Sustainable Solutions? For folks that are just joining us, Sustainable Solutions Speaker Series is presented by the Environmental Sciences and Policy and Energy and Policy and Climate Programs at Johns Hopkins University. Each talk features scholars and practitioners working to tackle wicked environmental, energy, and climate problems. Our speaker this month was awarded the Johns Hopkins University 2021 Excellence in Teaching Award in Environmental Sciences and Policy. Professor Elizabeth Hassami will be speaking about the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. So let's hear a little bit more about her and her amazing background. Uh, Elizabeth Hassami is a licensed attorney and faculty lecturer of our International Environmental Policy and Envir Environmental and Natural Resources Security for our Johns Hopkins uh, program in the Environmental Science and Policy. Hassami has served as the visiting attorney for the Environmental Law Institute for nearly a decade, researching post-conflict natural resource management and specializing in armed conflict and the environment. Hassami has served as a consultant on Afghanistan, natural resources, armed conflict, and peace building. And she was appointed in 2019 to serve on the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and is active in the specialty group on peace, security, and conflict. Her writings on Afghanistan have appeared in Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, the Wilson Center for Environmental Change and Security, and the American Bar Association publications. She is a founding member of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association, for which she is currently producing content and serves on the education interests and law interest groups. Professor Hassami, we are so honored to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us um, your knowledge about the environment and the, in the relationship to armed conflict. So I'm going to turn over the sharing capacities to you, and thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hansen, and I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, uh, discussing this topic because it's one that I don't think many people know anything about. So we're going to be talking about the recent um, uh, adoption by the United Nations International Law Commission of um, a new set of principles, the new legal framework on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. Now, if anybody has been following this discussion today, you may have seen a change because at first um, it was uh, put a during armed conflict, but it really is in relation to armed conflict. It's a much more comprehensive legal framework. It's not just looking at during armed conflict, which you know traditionally in the law of armed conflict, we it's been concerned with what's happening during wartime, during armed conflicts. Um, but it's, you know, we're looking at a much broader scope now. We're looking at how to prevent conflict, how to mitigate situations during armed conflict, and how to remediate uh, issues with the environment after armed conflict. So I'm really excited because just recently, um, a, a few months ago, um, the UN ILC, the International Law Commission, has adopted this new legal framework, a new set of principles that are just crucial, they're critical for the protection of the environment um, during wartime or on armed conflict, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and so I just think they're very important. And um, so I'm here to, to answer questions and I have a short presentation just to, not to bore everybody, but to just um, educate you a little bit about what they are um, and what they um, aspire to do. And, and so, uh, whenever it's ready, I can start running through the PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. So um, again, I'm a faculty lecturer here at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm, I've also been a visiting attorney uh, with the Environmental Law Institute working primarily on our conflict issues. And I've actually worked on Afghanistan and consulted on Afghanistan for, for many, many years. But after the fall um, of the government last summer, I turned my attention to, more to Ukraine. So I'm using Ukraine as a bit of an example during in this PPT. Um, and my first 
horrible picture here is why this is important. Um, because oftentimes in, in wartime, uh, the environment is kind of what we call the silent victim of war um, and hopefully silent no more because what happens to the environment directly impacts people of the nations that where there is armed conflict. So it's just critical. So this first picture is of course of um, a toxic waste pond that was hit by a shell uh, in Ukraine. And obviously you can see the thick black smoke. It's, it's quite a horrific image of damage to the environment there. Okay, so next slide. So I'm gonna start off with what are the um, uh, PRAC principles? And um, so PRAC just means protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. And again, we're talking about in relation to not just during, but before, during, and after armed conflict. This is critical to understand. Um, but they outline how we should go about um, setting forth protections for the, arm, for, for the environment. And I have here, if you're interested in reading in, in detail uh, the principles, that's the, um, that's the link at the UN. Um, you can just write, jot that down, or even I think if you Google probably UN and um, principles uh, for the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict, they'll come up. But that's, that is the link. Um, and that is from the Conflict and Environment Observatory, or CEOPS, which is an excellent organization. I have to give them a shout out because they work on uh, this kind of um, topic as well. Okay, next slide. So why do we need these principles? Well, I'd like to start with just a quick quote from David Jensen at UNEP. Um, and he is one of the leading experts on this topic in the world. And this is from um, a MOOC or a massive open online course that we um, at uh, ELI and NPAX, that's the Environmental Law Institute and the Environmental Peace Building Association, both organizations of which I, I work with in some capacity or another. But a few years ago, we had a massive open online course, um, and I believe it's gonna be rerun, I'm not sure, but on this topic of armed conflict in the environment. So David in this, um, in this course said, almost every international armed conflict over the past decade has involved natural resources in some way, and it has had environmental impacts. Now we all know that obviously during armed conflict, uh, negative impacts on the environment and obviously on human populations, which is, it goes without saying, but I'm not focusing on civilian casualties in this lecture, just understand that. But of course we understand that that is you know, a terrible, terrible also toll um, of war. Uh, but the negative impacts of armed conflict on the environment are undeniable and devastating. So you have deforestation, water and air pollution, chemical contamination from muni munitions such as landmines. And landmines are uh, one of the most horrific um, uh, aspects of warfare on the environment and on civilian populations because they tend to extend wartime decades from when the war is over. Um, it, you know, we're in, for example, in Afghanistan, there are many, many, many landmines undiscovered in civilian areas that are still continuing that occupation long after it's over. Um, the targeting of oil facilities and impacts of on wildlife are also horrific. Now, why is this important? Well, of course, we understand it's, it's very important, but it's also becoming increasingly important as the climate changes. Climate change is causing increased pressure on natural resources as the temperature rises. We all know what's happening, um, uh, and which in turn means natural resources conflicts are increasing as well. But the principles also address you know, issues of lands of indigenous persons and refugees and internally displaced persons who were displaced by conflict. And so we need to look at what's happening with the lands that they're on and are they, do they have protections? And are those protections um, adequate? And oftentimes they're not. So um, that's another aspect to this. Okay, um, next slide. So I think I wanted to give an example of um, a current conflict that everyone will be familiar with most likely and I think Ukraine is an incredibly tragic and um, timely example of this. So we have 110 documents, and this is a few months ago, actually. So this is probably far when this report was issued, but it's probably far more now. But 110 documented environmental crimes that will affect Ukraine's water, soil, and air, wild and wildlife indefinitely. That means not just now during the, the conflict, but far into the future for decades, most likely. 
Um, and then I give examples of attacks on fossil fuel infrastructure, electricity stations, water supplies, and nuclear facilities even, which is you know, something that's kind of unprecedented. Um, and the government of Ukraine, Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources issued a report where they stated, a this is a violation of all existing norms of international law on nature protection, sustainable development, humanitarian law, and basic, just basic norms of morality and principles of coexistence. And I absolutely agree with that. Next slide. So to talk about armed conflict in the environment, obviously during armed conflict, there's going to be environmental damage and we all understand that. And that may be inevitable, um, but it cannot be without limits. And there need to be methods to prevent, mitigate and remediate the destruction that's caused during armed conflict. This is so critical. To, um, to not just the environment, but obviously human populations living in that environment. Um, so this all began, obviously this is not a new topic. This has been a topic of conversation for you know, decades and certainly certain aspects of this, such as that you don't poison wells has been known for centuries. There's been agreed upon laws of warfare that most, um, most people understand. But so to take this whole discussion, in 94, the General Assembly first requests a report from the International Commission on the Red Cross. So that kind of got the ball rolling. Um, and the ICRC issued guidelines um, to assist in the instruction and training of armed forces on international humanitarian law, protecting the natural environment. So that's kind of where this whole topic got started in 94. Um, next slide. <laughs> But this particular, um, these particular principles really um, came to the forefront um, in a report. This idea got rolling with this report that I actually, in, in both of my courses, I assign uh, par portions of it. It's called Protecting the Environment During Armed Conflict. Now, this is a bit of an older report. It came out in 09, I believe, but it's, it's um, just incredibly um, important and, um, again, got the ball rolling. So research in the early 2000s resulted in this report. Um, uh, and that was done by UNEP and ELI, and that's Carl Brook and others. And I've worked with Carl for many years and a, a shout out to him because he's one of the principals in this field, like David Jensen. And I, I'm very grateful to his um, guidance on the topic. Um, but work formally began in 2013 when this topic was included in the UN International Law Commission's program of work officially. Um, and so the ILC took a look and found that existing international legal frameworks um, for the protection of the environment during armed conflict were lacking and fragmented. Um, so the report asked the UN ILC to examine the existing, existing international law for protecting the environment during armed conflict and recommend how this could be clarified codified and expanded. And this kind of um, was the genesis of the idea for these principles. Okay, next slide. Great. So this brings us up to kind of current day and what's happened this summer, which is extremely exciting. So the International Law Commission um, formally adopted 27 principles on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. Um, this will go to the General Assembly in October. Um, and um, the, just to let anyone know who, who, who looks up these principles or reads about them, there have been some changes. They went from being uh, 28 to 27, I believe uh, two were merged and the numbering has changed occasionally. So, um, but the, the, the link I gave at the very beginning of my talk, or if you even just go to the UN and Google um, the principles, um, you will see that the most recent principles are from August of 2022. Uh, so um, yeah, so we're hoping that they will be adopted by the General Assembly next month. And I wanted to just give a special mention to the special rapporteurs um, from Sweden and Finland, Murray Jacobson and Maria Leto from Finland, who studied this topic and worked on these principles for, for years. Um, so why are these so important? Well, the principles take, again, a broader temporal and holistic approach. Um, we're looking at the full spectrum of armed conflict, the conflict cycle. And this is so important. Um, and I just wanna go through a few of the specific principles that I feel like are most important because I think that's really important to understand what we're talking about here. 
So we look at principle one, and this is just setting, setting forth at the very beginning that we're talking about the whole conflict life cycle, before, during, and after armed conflict. Um, principle two is your purpose, and this is to prevent, mitigate, and remediate harm to the environment, also critical. Principle three states that we must take this. Now, this is very interesting and probably controversial to a lot of, also when I say states, that's obviously a nation. Controversial to many nations. Um, but um, states must take legal, administrative, and judicial measures to enhance protection. In other words, state responsibility. Um, and principle four states that uh, states, this is very interesting and important too. States should designate areas as this is preventative. So we're talking before conflict arises, this should be done. Should designate areas of major environmental and cultural importance as protected zones. Again, a preventative measure because we're looking at how can we uh, minimize the harm to the environment before there's even a conflict. Let's, let's go ahead and start saying, hey, this area <coughs> is of major cultural importance. And I just saw in my chat that somebody from Iran popped up, which is, you know, uh, which is welcomed. So for example, like Persepolis in Iran would be, a, um, would be an area of major cultural importance that you would not want to be in the crosshairs of war. So I just use that as an example, um, but you know, or, or very important rainforest or biodiverse areas. And of course we know that many, many conflicts happen unfortunately in biodiversity hotspots, which is tragic. And so um, we wanna go ahead and we wanna just, um, Right away, before there's a conflict state, you know what, if there's ever going to be a conflict in the future, okay, this is off limits. You cannot attack these certain areas that are of really important cultural significance or environmental significance. Um, now, I'm sure people are thinking, well, what does this even mean? And if you're not familiar with international law, it gets very complex as to how you enforce and this kind of thing. So I won't get, I won't get into that. Um, please join me for my courses at Hopkins because we, we delve into all those um, aspects of um, enforcement of international law. But, um, but just to say that these take a wider scope and they now address interstate and intrastate um, conflicts, which intrastate, meaning civil wars, insurgencies, that sort of thing, really are, are generally speaking, uh, more common uh, than the old sort of um, traditional state versus state um, conflicts. Okay. Okay, so I've chosen a few of the principles that I think are most critical and important. And this one is protection of the environment of indigenous persons. And I think this is just incredibly critical because um, you, you have to take in con consultation before you go to war, you know, what's happening with territories that indigenous people habitate uh, or are inhabiting. Um, and that should be done before conflict, that should be off limits. Um, and so this is just setting that forth. And of course, um, protection of the environment of indigenous persons is also um, stated in other uh, multilateral environment agreements like UNDRIP and others. Um, and, um, but this just kind of, this is bringing it all together. This is kind of pulling from many different treaties, existing law and, um, and restatements or manuals or whatever, and bring it into, that's what the principles are. They're just bringing them all together into one cohesive document that, um, or a list of principles that, so everyone can see what's expected and, and hopefully states will uh, implement these in their own military manuals and laws and that kind of thing. So anyways, this one I think is incredibly important, the protection of indigenous persons and their territories. Um, and after an armed conflict has been uh, has affected an environment, this the states out that the states the nations should undertake effective consultations and cooperation with those peoples um, through procedures with their representative institutions. So important um, to, for taking remedial measures. Um, I can't stress that enough. There's been uh, so many times that the lands of indigenous persons are devastated and and you know, nothing happens. Nobody's really held accountable. There's no remediation and, and that's just tragic. So uh, next slide. This one is of incredible importance to me, um, uh, human displacement. It's not only important to me, but it's, it's going to be increasingly important as climate change 
uh, causes more and more damage and causes more and more um, uh, migration issues, mass migration issues. Um, and it's sort of a terrible cycle because climate change will cause more stress over natural resources, which causes more conflict. Uh, and so this sort of states that um, states, international organization, and other relevant actors should take appropriate measures to prevent and mitigate environmental degradation in areas where persons displaced by armed conflict, and that could be refugees, IDPs, which is internally displaced persons, and actually during armed conflict, internally displaced persons are your are a lot more common. Um, people, you know, nobody wants to leave their home or their homeland, and um, rarely during armed conflict, but oftentimes people are displaced within their nation. And so uh, they're not really, uh, they don't come under the banner of refugee, which has some protection from the UN, uh, the UN um, uh, protections for refugees, but um, most people are IDPs. And so that's, this is sort of addressing that anyone displaced by conflict that the, the, um, the nation, um, and other relevant actors should be taking appropriate measures to prevent and mitigate, again, environmental de degradation in areas because it's so horrible to be displaced from your home and then you're in an area that's being shelled or contaminated. If You can just imagine how horrible that is and, and it's sort of a, a, a terrible situation. Uh, so um, that one's very important to me. And uh, next slide. So this is also very, very important. Uh, principles 10 and 11 on corporate due diligence and corporate liability. Now, um, these require states, and again, that just means nations, to exercise due diligence and protect the environment in conflicted areas. Like if corporations are operating or businesses are operating within a nation, but they are doing things in a nation that across the world that is across the globe, that's in the midst of an armed conflict or is unstable, because this applies before conflict too. Let's say there's a lot of conflict over natural resources and corporations are kind of exploiting that to get say raw materials for um, renewables. That would be one example. This addresses that. Um, and this is also to de deter conflict financing through the exploitation, exploitation and trade in natural resources and conflict zones. So this is directly targeting um, responsibility of corporate actors from preying on local populations during periods of political instability, during conflict and post-conflict when a state is very fragile. So I think this is also critical. Uh, next slide. And just uh, 14 and 15, this is just the application of the laws of armed conflict to the natural environment. So, you know, if you know anything about LOAC, um, rules on distinction, proportionality, military necessity, and precautions should be applied to um, the natural environment as well with a view to protecting it. Um, that's really important, I think. Uh, next slide. Uh, this one applies in situations of occupation. So this, I, I don't think this is a very high bar, honestly, although there have been um, some calls for this to be kind of taken out or there have been some objections to this, which I really don't understand because all it says is that an occupying power shall respect and protect the environment of that occupied territory in accordance with applicable international law. So I don't, again, I don't think this is a high bar, but you know, this is just the basics. Like you should really um, try to prevent significant harm to the environment that you're occupying. Um, and you should respect the law institutions of that territory concerning protection of the environment and only introduce changes within the limits provided by the law of armed conflict. So these are just some very baseline requirements that um, really I don't think should be groundbreaking, but there have been uh, um, opposition from some states over this. And you can um, definitely Google, um, uh, actually, if you want to, you can go to CEOB, C -E -O -B -S, Again, the Conflict and Environment Observatory, they have some wonderful reports that were written by Doug Weir and Stavros Pantazopoulos at CEOBS on this topic of the, of the um, protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them because they've done tremendous, wonderful work on this topic. Uh, next slide. And peace processes. So as part of the peace agreements, um, and this is something that I've uh, been very interested in 
but they should address matters relating to the restoration and the protection of the environment damaged by conflict. Again, because I've spent so many years studying Afghanistan, and one of the big tragedies in Afghanistan was that um, the Soviet Union did tremendous damage to the environment, and there was really almost no remediation, period. Um, and um, so that's absolutely tragic, because in, in rural parts of Afghanistan, there's still damage to water infrastructure that, that was from, you know, the 80s. It's, that's just tragic. So that's an important aspect of including this in your peace agreements, your peace process. You've got to look at, okay, what was damaged? What needs to be done? How are we going to fix it? That sort of thing. And so I just wanted to add some of the final ones here. Um, assessment and remedi remediation, obviously. Uh, remnants of war, um, uh, they need to remove or render harmless, toxic, and, and hazardous remnants of war um, that are under their control or causing risk or damage to the environment. And of course, landmines would be the first one I would think of because they are so horribly toxic and devastating to the population, not just to the environment. I mean, they render, prime agricultural lands, um, you know, uh, completely contaminated, but also to local populations. So many things that we're talking about with the environment also impact local populations and, and often very vulnerable populations. Um, and then to principle 27 is the same sort of idea, but at sea. So you're talking about, you know, um, uh, anything that could harm a marine environment, um, which again, uh, impacts local populations. Okay, and next slide. So I just wanted to include this picture of when I talk about like remediation of the land, this was a great project in Kabul. Of course, this is in 2018 before the Taliban takeover um, last summer, but um, I thought it was a beautiful project, the Kabul Greenbelt project, where they were planting trees in an area that had been kind of devastated by, um, by the war, and it just restores dignity to the to the land, to the population. Um, sadly, with this, I don't know what's happened. I don't have any more contact with anyone over there, unfortunately. But my hope is that those trees are still growing and um, and flourishing. Um, I, I I really do. Um, and next slide. So what's still needed? Okay, so discussions on nuclear weapons clearly is a big topic. And I'm sure everyone's sitting out there thinking, what about nukes? Um, that is a huge issue. Um, and one that is very, very tense amongst superpowers with a nuclear power, especially. And it's not popular um, to talk about the incredible damage they do to the environment. So as you can imagine, there's always um, blowback on that topic. Um, also, accountability of non-state armed groups for environmental damage, which is huge. Um, and climate change security issues um, are also things that aren't really addressed as well in the principles, but they still need further. These are all, you know, legal frameworks are always um, uh, there. This is a, a process. And it's, you know, even if these are adopted by the, the GA, the General Assembly, the process is not over, this is ongoing. This is what we study every day and what we're hoping to push forward a little bit at a time. Um, and so next slide, I think maybe, oh yeah, so going forward. Okay, so what does this mean? So the big deal here is that, um, and this may be a bit of a letdown, but, um, uh, oh, okay, and someone just asked, I just noticed um, to repeat the author she mentioned who gave, um, research on armed conflict. So I want to, again, tell people to go to CEOBS, and then you can Google the reports that have been issued. But Doug Weir is um, one of the heads of CEOPS, and he's authored along with Stavros Pantazopoulos um, reports. But you, you, again, just go to CEOPS and, um, and, and just type in whatever you want to see, and the reports will come up. Um, but back to my um, presentation here. Sorry, I just wanted to address that because it, it, it came up. Um, so this has already started discussions amongst nations, and that's really the first, state, the first step. I think one thing that many of my students find so frustrating about international law is that much of it is law by consent, basically. It's, uh, it's very hard to get a superpower to do anything if they don't want to do it. Um, and so peer pressure is oftentimes the most effective way to get nations to do things. And so you start having discussions and and there needs to be a consensus that this is not right. Um, just like there were consensus, cons, um, consensus about the poisoning of you know, wells, 
centuries ago, people recognize, okay, no, that's not good for anyone to do. If we start poisoning water supplies, that's going to impact everybody and it's probably not a good idea. So that was decided that was really not something that should be done. Um, so these are kind of, it's the law, uh, this legal framework is in development, of, of course, and, but this is a big step forward, probably the biggest step that we've seen since the 70s. So I'm obviously very excited about it. Um, and the goal, of course, here um, is the implement, oh, oh sorry, um, thanks. The goal is the implementation of these principles into domestic law and military manuals. So that these are guidelines for militaries when they go into conflict, they already know, okay, you know what? Um, we don't wanna go into, we don't wanna you know, bomb areas of significant cultural importance or environmental. This area is a biodiversity hotspot. We need to stay away. From, let's all agree to stay away from that area. That would be the goal. And Fernando Borden wrote, codification conventions and articles completed by the International Law Commission are often, and this is so critical, invoked by courts, tribunals, governments, and international organizations as quote unquote, reflections of customary international law. That's critical because if they're seen as um, customary international law, then that's quite a bit of credence that they, that they hold. So I think that may be the last slide. Um, yeah, I think that's the last slide. Excellent, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hassami. Uh, I just wanna remind our viewers that um, there is a Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can use to type questions in. I'm actually not gonna be screening the chat for questions because there's a lot going on in the chat. I'll be screening the Q&A section. Um, and to get things going, we were talking earlier um, and I actually have a couple of questions just from our own uh, community um, that aren't in the Q&A just yet. Um, about some of the things that you mentioned about the principles. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, in terms of before, during, and after armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Does it have any, and I haven't, I confess, I haven't gone through and read them mm -hmm. other than weeks ago when you sent them to me and I scanned mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, but how is that determined um, with respect to the before, during, and after? Is there criteria in there? Um, because I know in certain areas, um, there may be ongoing conflict that kind of lingers for exactly. years. Very, very true, um, Dr. DeRosa. And there are certain states, you know, like when you look at Afghanistan, it was never really a post-conflict state. It was sort of always in sort of some sort of state of conflict. So it, it's very hard to separate, you know, um, strictly before, during, and after uh, in situations, but I think the point being is just to look at prevention. How can we, if you have states that are completely not in a conflict cycle right now, what could the state look at how they could prevent if something was to happen? You know, are there areas of special significance in their nation that would be off limits that they would say, you know what, we're just letting everyone know this is off limits. And then of course, um, the remedial measures, you know, we hope if there's a resolution to Ukraine, um, people are already thinking about, well, what, what do we need to do to, um, to restore the environment? And I think there are many people already thinking about that, hoping that there's a resolution. Of course, we don't know when that will be, and, and no one can say for sure. But uh, at least this gives you sort of a framework to look at. So, Okay. All right. That makes more sense to me. Mm -hmm. then. Um, there was another part that you were mentioning where Although a nation may not be actively involved in armed conflict, um, they may have corporations or companies that are headquartered within that nation uh -huh. um, that operate in an area of armed conflict. Uh -huh. um, and my question was, is, are those, in terms of the principles, is that mainly geared towards corporations that are doing extraction of natural resources in areas of armed conflict? Uh -huh. Or am I too limited in my thinking? Is there is there more going on that I'm not thinking of? No, I think that could that could be many different situations, but you're absolutely right. I think that that would be my first thought too, is mining. Um, okay. and, and particularly when we look at um, uh, minerals that are critical to renewables, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a lot more accountability of nations who have companies operating, and of course, fossil fuel extraction too. Uh, I think that's important too. But specifically for, um, for mining in conflict zones um, or post-conflict zones that are still fragile in very fragile states, 
I think a state needs to have some response and take some responsibility and look at what, you know, at least putting their corporations on notice, like you need to, um, to take this into consideration, you know, where you're operating, what is the situation there? Um, so that, I think that's what, um, what that principle um, is about. Okay, that makes sense. And we had a question in the chat that's related to this. Um, would this sit with that same principle also apply to the role of NGOs that are maybe based in like the United States, but they're functioning in an area of mm -hmm. armed conflict? Yeah, I would think so. And in fact, some of the some of the uh, principles, I I would argue personally that that it shouldn't just be limited to. Um, and I think I have in uh, ELI we. Um, presented some comments to the special rapporteurs about wording of how you word the principles. And I think some of us felt like the, the, the principle should not just say state. Um, there's one state, there's one principle that says states, international organizations, and other um, parties or something like that um, to include not just states, but um, NGOs and insurgent groups and um, just kind of make, casting a wider net. Um, but that was done on some and not on others. And so, again, this is all work in progress as far as I know. So. Okay. Um, now, to get to our first question on, in the chat, um, you have a wonderful lecture. And if you could add a principle or maybe even um, tweak or, or expand on a principle, um, what would you add or what would you expand on? Well, thank you for that question. That's so important. And I think one thing that's not really directly addressed in the principle, and I, I think it's one of the most important um, aspects to armed conflict and the environment is water infrastructure. Because you take something like a dam and it's not just, it, it doesn't have just one purpose, it has many purposes. It can be um, a source for drinking water, it can be um, hydropower, it can be also, for example, um, irrigation for agriculture, and in Afghanistan, that was the case for sure with their dams. And so if you are targeting dams, that's incredibly destructive, not just to the environment, but to populations. And it, it can be used as a tactic of manipulation on all different sides. Um, and of course, when I'm talking to this, I'm talking before the Taliban take over um, because most of my research was done um, before they took over. So, but that was actually something that happened. Um, it was used to intimidate local population. Well, we'll destroy your, your dam and then you won't be able to, you know, water your crops and then your population will be, you know, starving and have no water. It's just horrible. So I think something to address water infrastructure would be very helpful. I think that's an excellent point, actually. And um, when you think about water infrastructure and its connection to, well, obviously access to fresh water as a reservoir, but uh, hydroelectricity, um, but also just its connection to uh, irrigation for agriculture and the food yeah. aspect as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really good point. Um, piggybacking off of water, um, you had talked about the war at sea principle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably because I'm coming from an oceanography background, I mm -hmm. felt like um, it in my personal opinion, I felt like it should have been expanded more just because yeah. two thirds of the earth is ocean. Uh -huh. um, and so I just kind of wanted your, your thoughts on this. And we also had a question as well, just because, um, and I'm also thinking with respect to Navy and Naval conflict at sea, there's a uh -huh. lot of armed conflict that takes place at sea. Uh -huh. And then there's different components of the sea, the exclusive economic zone versus uh -huh. open ocean. We also had a question. I know I'm just, I'm really rambling there. I didn't have a question there. It's just me uh, talking. We also had a question from Sophie in terms of uh, removing the remnants of war at sea. How is that monitored or determined? Right. Um, because the ocean is really a very unique environment that often has diffuse types of pollution. Mm -hmm. I know there's still many parts of the ocean that have mines from wars mm -hmm. many decades ago, mm -hmm. and it's very much a global commons. So mm -hmm. who who kind of, um, I guess, could that principle be expanded? And, and okay. also who's associated with that protection for such a large global commons? That's a really great question. And when I look at, especially on the seas, it's almost like when you have mining companies in very remote areas, who is going to monitor that? Or in very remote areas like of Afghanistan, um, and oftentimes they're just not, it's almost impossible to do. Um, so there are some realities to these principles that maybe very, very difficult 
um, to achieve. And honestly, um, you know, that's another area that needs to be uh, um, expanded upon for sure. I agree. I agree. Okay. Well, yeah. And I didn't mean to <laughs> have oh, no. a long-winded question. No, no. I was just thinking out loud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think a couple of us would like to see that maybe uh, expanded a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one question is, which nations have been pushing for the adoption of these principles um, the hardest? And are you, um, mm. are you, are you aware of um, that in particular, maybe? You know, there's, um, you know, I don't want to say specific nations that have and have not, because I do know what they are. But if you, if, stu um, if students or people watching this Google, um, and I think it's probably, again, in a CIOPS report, there is, let me see if I can find there is a briefing paper on exactly which countries are pro and against and have made very clear statements about objecting to certain principles. And um, there are some clear, it's very obvious why some, some nations um, object. There are some nations, I, I think it was Colombia that was very pro, um, I think it was Colombia that was for um, the principles and uh, strongly. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to Google that, um, um, there's a paper called Strengthening the International Law Commission's Newly Adopted Draft Principles on the Protection of the Environment in Relation to Armed Conflict. Um, I believe that one goes into all the specific comments of the nations. Um, and again, there's a lot of um, very, very interesting situations where a nation will have many, many mining companies headquartered in it, <laughs> and then all of a sudden doesn't like a certain principle. And it's very clear as to why. Um, but again, I won't um, call out any any nation specifically, but feel free to research that because it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense though. With anything being developed at an international effort, you're going to have nations supporting um, aspects of it, but maybe having um, issues with particular parts that they want to change because exactly. it serves their interests better. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's a very large uh, task to, <laughs> to take on. Exactly. Um, we have a really good question by Ed um, with respect to, he says these rules and guidelines make great sense, mm -hmm. but how can we possibly uh, enforce or prioritize such environmental and cultural considerations? Mm -hmm. And I think he's speaking with respect to the, the principles in the indigenous um, mm -hmm. regions. Mm -hmm. When armed conflicts themselves are often criminal acts mm -hmm. and are motivated against um, often right. like ethnic superiority or yes. religious purpose. Mm -hmm. And the main goal is often in these situations to either conquer another um, group of people or to erase another group of people. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially he's asking, how are these rules relevant um, when at least one of the players is not even uh, willing to acknowledge the rules. And I know that's probably a, a big uh, consideration right. that you guys have when you're working on it. Absolutely, and this goes to enforcement. Um, how do you enforce international law? And you will see certain countries being dragged to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Um, and, and that is one method. Um, there, again, there's also the peer pressure of other nations just saying, you know, um, what you're doing is unconscionable. It doesn't mean they're going to stop or anyone can really stop them, but um, this is again an imperfect uh, field. Uh, it, I, again, I say my students are always frustrated when they start taking the course because they want to have an answer as to who's going to like stop them. You know, how do you stop them? And um, I think, <laughs> as certain examples this year show, it's very very difficult. But this sets out the this sets out a general. Um, agreed upon customary sort of international principles that everyone is saying, okay, this is what we consider to be international law. And, you know, if you're going to violate that, it's particularly, um, and I'm just thinking because, um, you know, for example, like Shia populations in Afghanistan were, were heavily targeted over centuries and um, it's unconscionable now. Uh, that's a whole different example that's not necessarily an indigenous persons but it is a minority a religious minority um and you know how do you stop that it's very very difficult um but i think especially with indigenous persons who are in specific areas and the nation can say you know if we're going to have conflict in the future this is this area is off limits 
Um, and you're right, they're going to be bad actors who just don't care and who are going to go in there and just destroy everything. And as we've seen this year, what do you do about that? What can be done? I don't know. It's very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, um, this we're talking about it here and um, hopefully uh, lawyers with more uh, clout than me are, are working on it. Uh, so that's the best answer I can give. Them. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it it makes sense though. We don't. Um, what's the old expression? We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just be. <laughs> you have to start somewhere. Yeah, you, you have, have to, to start, start somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. And this is the thing that's so exciting about this is that actually, um, if you look at Vietnam and the incredible environmental damage that was done there, like there are areas of Vietnam that nothing will ever grow ever again um, because of the chemicals that were dropped there. And so this is a progression of, okay, that is wrong. We need to address uh, the use of napalm or things like that. Um, and so it's, it's a process and it doesn't mean that it's perfect or that it's never gonna be used. These things, these kind of herbicides are never gonna be used again. But at least I think the world is aware that they have incredibly destructive um, propensities and ideally they shouldn't be used. So during warfare. So. Well, that brings me to the next question, which um, is really a bit more about consequences. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, um, you had mentioned the guidelines are looking to be implemented in military manuals mm -hmm. and domestic law. Mm -hmm. Are there talks happening now about what the consequences might look like if they're not followed by a certain nation um, moving forward? And, and this was my kind of popped in my head. You know how you see sometimes where a nation or state is tried for war crimes. And I imagine like in the future, you would see a nation or state being tried for crimes against the environment. Mm -hmm. um, is so, and I don't even know if that's possible because this isn't my field, but um, so I guess that's the question. What would that look like? And is that starting to kind of take place as, mm -hmm. as um, talks and plans? Well, you know, I think this kind of runs in parallel to the discussions of adding uh, ecocide as um, you know another um, cause of action that you could bring um, to the ICC, uh, and so I, I actually was on a great panel of attorneys talking about the addition of ecocide and you know how that would be possible. How could that be prosecuted at the ICJ? Um, and someone said, you know, really the value there probably is going to be in, in more in deterrence that just the thought of having to, you know, go in front of the, um, the uh, ICJ would be a bit of a deterrent. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we are with this as well. I don't know that anyone has um, uh, specifically discussed, you know, consequences, but we're still kind of looking at implementation and, um, and, right now okay and I, I i think the term ecocide actually fits better than my crimes against the environment i think that works better uh, <laughs> in in my head in terms of prosecuting in the future mm -hmm. um we had a good question here which really makes me think of kind of the ongoing conflict that's happening in ukraine mm -hmm. and this is coming from Catherine. in your opinion should significant environmental resources and maybe something like nuclear power plants mm -hmm. be considered international uh, territory or international resources. That way they may be able to access more protections and incentives for protecting them during armed conflict. Yeah, that's very, very interesting and an excellent point. Um, and, you know, uh, I just throw out there for anyone interested in this again, my international environmental policy course because we'll get into issues of like um, state sovereignty. And um, so I absolutely agree. I do think those should be internationally protected in some sense, but how is that nation going to feel about that? Because it's within their borders. Um, and so you get into issues like state sovereignty a lot. Um, when things seem to make sense, like that, that's a no brainer. We would want international protection for that facility. Well, would the nation, you know, want foreign troops or, or whatever um, foreign actors in there. So it, it gets really complicated quickly, but if that's possible, absolutely, I would agree with that for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is in relation to one of the principles you mentioned about civil war and intrastate conflict. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about sometimes in the news, we hear just in the United States about um, 
examples of acts of domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. Would that classify if there is damage done to the environment? Mm -hmm. Would something like that fall within the um, within the uh, guidelines um, that you're think, describing? I would think certainly you could make the argument because um, if you're looking at insurgent groups um, perpetrating that, then um, that I think I think that could be. Uh, a strong case for that. Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking more of Afghanistan because I've studied it for so long, um, which is an unusual situation because you had insurgent groups who are now the government, who are fighting other insurgent groups and terrorism within their own nation now um, with ISIS. So it, it's sort of a you know a terrible situation. Um, in in this situation, I, I could in the U.S. Um, if you had that happen, I I could think that would be covered. I would think that would be under that umbrella, so to speak. Okay. Um, we also had a good question here from Bob asking if there's been any historical examples of post-conflict environmental re remediation by victors. And I also wanted to kind of add to that, or if there's been any, you, you mentioned there was a principle about occupiers. Uh -huh. um, and I know that was a, a little bit uh, conflicted among some of the people working on the principles. Uh -huh. Is there any examples of, of of occupiers that are even remediating the area where they're occupying? Um, or if, if you're not at liberty to give specific examples, is there a resource that you can point people to for um, additional examples? Wow, that's a great, the first, um, the first resource I wanna give everyone is the Environmental Peace Building Association because that has sort of become, um, an amazing resource of reports and statistics and anything you want to research, please go to uh, uh, the Environmental Peace Building Association. Um, I personally, since 2013, have been helping to build the library of reports on uh, environmental damage, armed conflict, um, all over the globe uh, in, in pretty much any conflict you can think about on there. So you can go on there and, and there's all the different topics and themes you can, you can search. Um, so that's a great place to search. Um, and as far as specific examples, um, uh, currently, um, I, I'm very interested in what's happening um, in Ukraine and to see where this goes. I don't think that's going to be, <laughs> I'm not sure that there's going to be anything happening in that situation. Um, unfortunately, uh, my other area of research, like in Afghanistan, um, I don't know of any that the Soviets did in Afghanistan. And I I don't know if the Taliban is doing anything. I, I have no idea. Um, but um, I would think after World War II, I, I don't know if there was, um, that's not really the same situation. I, I'm not sure, I, I'll leave that. Uh, but I will give you the um, Environmental Peace Building Organization um, is a great place to start your research if you're interested in that topic. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good resource that everyone should go and check out. Um, this question um, is a good question in terms of uh, wondering if the principles apply or not to this uh, situation. There are armed conflicts um, between environmental and land human rights defenders and corporate companies sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we see sometimes how companies use military force or military-like forces to resist protests of defenders, which mm -hmm. can sometimes turn violent. Mm -hmm. um, is this, does this fall under that umbrella of these principles or because it's particular to an organization and uh, protesters, does it, does it not? I mean, I guess this is going back to that armed conflict definition within the principles. Right. Yeah, this, this would be, I'm not sure how we could, I mean, I'm sure that would apply somewhere. That would be, but I, I just have to say that actually anyone involved in environmental protection or writing about it or anything, it's extremely dangerous, um, particularly in, in other less industrialized nations. Um, we forget how how dangerous it is and how brave the people who are standing up for their lands, for indigenous peoples are. Um, I, I just, I hope that these are applicable to helping them because um, it, it's actually more, I believe I read a, a, a statement that said it's actually more dangerous to write about the environment than to write about like cartels 
uh, in South America, which is frightening. I mean, it's more dangerous to be, if you're living in South America, it's more dangerous to write about the environment and protection of the environment than to write about cartels. That's, that just says it all to me. So um, I think those people really need to be um, lauded and, and hopefully protected. And, and I think you can make an argument that some of these principles apply to them as well. So um, to their protections. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, that's a, that is a good example also that really makes you think about a situational uh, application. Um, for the sake of time, because I want to make sure we have time to kind of wrap things up, I'm going to take one more question. And I know there's still a few more questions in our Q&A. So I want to encourage anyone, if they ever want to, ever want to talk with uh, Professor Hasami, they can always reach out to her on email. And I encourage you to also, uh, if you're one of our students, sign up for one of her classes. Uh, she's a <laughs> spectacular instructor. Um, but the, for our final question, um, which of the principles do you find to be the most innovative in terms of progressing the legal frameworks mm. on armed conflict? Excellent question. And I really, I am really, uh, there's more than one, there's about four, so I won't go too deep into this. I know we're almost out of time. I think the ones on corporations um, and businesses operating in other countries and having states be aware that they need to take a look at what those corporations are doing in other countries is, is really innovative and it's at the forefront. And if you look at tech companies that are just getting some blowback from their, their business operations in Africa, especially in the DRC and places like that, this is, uh, and, and if you take my courses, we'll talk all about this, <laughs> but um, seriously, there have been lawsuits um, against those corporations and, um, and their actions and, uh, and, and human rights abuses in, in countries, uh, in especially Central Africa. So I think that's, um, that's really important. Um, human displacement and indigenous persons, uh, incredibly um, dear to my heart. My husband left Afghanistan in, when the Soviets invaded. So um, that's incredibly important to me. Um, and so those are just four that I think are really, really um, of particular interest to me. But I think they're all, all the principles are critical. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I think we're all going to be paying attention in October, which isn't that mm -hmm. far away yeah. to what happens with the General Assembly. Yeah. Um, so thank you for sharing this today and this conversation. And um, I also want to thank our audience for joining us and uh, Peter Huggins, our um, special yeah. events uh, coordinator from AAP yeah. and uh, Dr. Hansen, our program director from the ESP program. And since we can't hear our audience, can you guys please, before we sign off and say goodbye, give a little virtual clap in the <laughs> chat <laughs> so we can at least know that you, uh, that you're there and you <laughs> we really appreciate that. Well, um, I, yeah, I just oh, want to say thank you. Thank yeah. you to everyone for attending. I appreciate it. And thank you to um, Peter for helping me with the slides because I'm not very technical, honestly. And thank you so much for doc to Dr. DeRosa and Dr. Hansen for giving me the opportunity to just bring this whole topic to you. And please, if you're in Johns Hopkins, or um, if you're not, uh, the program is amazing. It's one of the best I've ever seen. I love teaching for them. And please feel free to um, register for my classes because we have a lot of fun. And we will really dig into issues of equity and um, sustainability and a, a lot of topics that are just really um, uh, incredibly important right now. Yeah. Thank you. And then for anyone who's still on, I was just gonna say our next speaker series seminar will be in October. And we're gonna be talking about the energy and climate provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act with our panel of experts. So stay tuned for that. And um, thank you, everybody. And Peter, whenever you're ready, you can sign us all off. Thanks. <laughs>